firstly, a definition, okay, um, from a biblical point of view, just to go forward. What I believe is marriage is an institution between one man and one woman, and sex is within that institution of marriage. Therefore, when I talk about singleness, I'm implicitly implying that celibacy is within singleness, to so take that as a given, and that sex is within marriage. So, this is going to be fun. Um, firstly, a disclaimer, I am not coming from any point of moral authority or judgment. Um, I just have to say that, so there's no hypocrisy pinned to me. But um, I'm just trying to say what I believe the Bible says. And everything I'm going to say can be summed up in one sentence. <coughs> so the next 15 to 20 minutes can be summed up in one sentence, which would cut it short. Which is, <laughs> singleness is a gift, and we can choose what to do with it. So, that's it. Singleness is a gift. I'm going to sit down now, to be honest. Uh, um, two Bible verses to prove this. To paraphrase Jesus in Matthew 19, he says, Not everyone can accept it is better to be single than to marry, but those who can accept it should accept it. And the main verse, 1 Corinthians 7 7, Paul says, But I wish everyone was single, just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. So we hear the Bible saying, you know, as much as in our society singleness can suck, we hear the Bible saying that it's actually a gift. And it's a gift from God, and therefore it needs to be taken seriously. So that's the overarching point I'm going to try and make, and hopefully convince everyone of, and myself of. And um, there's two points to this talk which are going to be, you know, stemming from that. The first is that this gift can be rejected, and often is, or it can not be considered. And we could be aiming for marriage or um, relationships and just completely forget or reject the gift of singleness. And then I'm going to talk about why we should actually accept the gift of singleness. Um, we're not going to, it's going to be quite a broad overview and we're going to get more into the individual details in the questions. So, um, oh, just to say also, is it one of those bad gifts like you get at Christmas that you have to pretend to like? <laughs> you know, and we shouldn't say, Thanks God for this gift, you know, we can have healing or prayer instead. <laughs> we need to be thankful with whatever gift God gives us. So, why do we resist singleness? Point one. Um, to be honest, I think it's to do with the fall and to do with sin, uh, which isn't very fashionable, but I think um, myself and society is broken. Um, we, you know, in terms of soul, mind, body, and relationships get influenced by that. So, to talk about singleness seems like an alien language today. And society really does go over the top. Song after song, you know, book after book, movie after movie, is all about relationships. And it's almost like the world worships relationships and thinks that's the most important thing. And we can get influenced by that. There's an ancient Persian proverb that says, if a man calls you a horse, ignore it. If two men call you a horse, consider it. And if three men call you a horse, buy a saddle. Um, it's ridiculous, but it shows us that, it shows us that uh, you know, we can get influenced so much by society, and they thought so back then. But we're not to be influenced by society, and society is always changing its mind and moving the goalposts on what sex and marriage is all about. So, what's gone wrong? Why is singleness not thought of as a gift? Now, either our sexual nature has gone wrong to some extent in the way we view sex and marriage, <coughs> or God is wrong and the Bible is wrong. So I'm going to read a quick quote here from C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Narnia novels and Rome Mitchell Wardrobe, which is now agree the gospel. Um, <laughs> anyone that doesn't know? And he was a logical, intellectual defender of his Christian faith, and it's really good to read some of his books. This one's from Mere Christianity. And he's just talking about sexual morality here and how he believes but it's just gone wrong somewhere along the line. And he says, the biological purpose of sex is children, just as the biological purpose of eating is to repair the body. Now, if we eat whenever we feel inclined, and just as much as we want, it is true that most of us will eat too much, but not terrifically too much. One man may eat enough for two, but he does not eat enough for ten. The appetite goes a little beyond its biological purpose, but not enormously. But if a healthy young man indulged his sexual appetite whenever he felt inclined, and if each act produced a baby, 
then he might easily populate a small village. <laughs> this appetite is a ludicrous and preposterous excess of its function. And he goes on to say, or well, take it another way. You can get a large audience together to watch a stripper. Now suppose you come to a country where you could fill a theatre simply by bringing a covered plate on a stage and then slowly lifting the cover to let everyone see, just before the lights went out, that it contained a mutton chop or a piece of bacon. Would you not think that something in that country had gone wrong with the appetite for food? And would not anyone else who had grown up in a different country or a different world think something was equally wrong about the state of the sex instinct among us? So that's the first thing about why singleness is so hard and why it's resisted so much. And really, why has this got into the state? Why is it so tough and why is it such a big deal and so hard in today's society? I'm going to give my opinion. Uh, it's just an opinion. But I believe it's because marriage and sex represents something greater. I think it's a signpost that points us to how our relationship should be to God and with God. And when people don't have the main thing, the relationship with God, they indulge in something that's similar to it, or the thing that's, that's meant to point to it becomes the thing that's the most important thing in their lives. And even if we do have a relationship with God, then, you know, it says in the Bible that we're going from glory to glory, and we're still in a process where we're getting there. So the, um, the signpost, the thing that points to the main relationship, can also still become majorly important and obsessive for a lot of people. And I also think that marriage and sex points to the very nature of who God is. So, in Genesis, where it says that a man shall leave his mother and father and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, the word there for one is a cat, which you know, doesn't mean one thing, it means two becoming one, one united um, being. And the word in the Shema, which is the Jewish statements of faithfulness that Jesus repeated and was in Deuteronomy, was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And the same word is used, a cow. This idea, it's a Trinitarian verse, this idea that God is united and diverse, yet one thing. So, God created the institution of marriage, not only to point us to how our relationship with God should be, but also to show something of his very nature within his image there that he created. So that's one reason, because things have gone wrong, about why singleness is so tough and why people desire relationships and sex so much. But is being single impossible? Is it, you know, are we bound to fail? Is it too tough? And, you know, whatever happens, the Gospel says that God loves us and he commanded his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, while we were still messing up, while we were still desiring things that weren't him, he sent his son to die for us. And many of us, especially in this area of relationships, crucify ourselves between two thieves, regrets of the past and fears of the future. And Christ crucified himself so that we wouldn't have to do that, so that our past can be clean, forgiven, restored, and our future could be full of trust and security in God. So it's important not to judge ourselves, of not you know, reject the gift of singleness out of hand simply because we think it would be too tough or too hard. Like, can you imagine having a conversation with King David and saying, I don't know, David, I've watched some porn, and he says, yeah, so did I, on the rooftop one time. And you say, oh, okay, David, I, I had sex with another man's wife. And he says, yeah, so did I. I yeah, it didn't end well. And then he, <laughs> he asks you a question and says, tell me, after... You did that. Did you kill the man? You know, did you kill the man afterwards? And you say, well, no. And he thinks, why not? You know, it's, uh, I'm not trying to minimise the sin of David, but I'm saying that David, despite that, was still forgiven, loved and restored, and used by God mightily. So we're not to judge ourselves in any way. Smith Wigglesworth was one of the most influential Christians of the 20th century, and he said that if you fall a thousand times in a week, strive to be holy. It does not matter how many times you fall, do not give in because of your fault. So we shouldn't beat ourselves up if we've made mistakes in the past. We shouldn't fear the future or think that singleness isn't a gift we can open and be called to. So in summary about why singleness is so hard, it's because marriage and relationships point to something greater and if we're broken in any way, which we all are, we can really desire that. But singleness is still 
a great gift, which we can open, which I'm going to talk about now, which is the second point. Why should we open the gift of singleness? Um, now, there's nothing wrong with sexual marriage. I'm not saying that we should be single because marry, you know, sex is in any way yucky or... <coughs> Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> we should, um, you know, marriage is in any way wrong. God created it. You know, he didn't create man and woman, turn around, get himself a drink, turn back around and say, what are you guys doing? You know, he, he created sex and it's a great thing. But some people are called to be single. And every single one of us in our life has been single at one time or another. Some people are called to it for a lifetime. And some people, because they're created uniquely in that way, and some people are called to it at any point in their life. So we should definitely embrace the gift and open it. Because singleness can be rewarding, and it isn't God's second best. It's an equal but separate, equal but separate calling to marriage. Jesus embraced singleness, Mother Teresa embraced singleness, the Apostle Paul embraced singleness. Um, many, many people have embraced singleness and we're still reaping the rewards for what they did and for the way they opened that gift. Paul was likely to be a red-blooded male, okay, and he rejected fame, wealth, prestige, power, influence, and he could have had any wife he wanted, but he chose to be single for the glory of God, and because that's what he felt God wanted him to do. And this is ultimately because we're called to a greater love. Now here's where it gets controversial. Okay. Um, married people, don't stone me. But I believe that the greatest joys and experiences we can all experience are not necessarily within marriage. Okay. If they were, that in the resurrection, Jesus would keep marriage. But he says that in the resurrection, there won't be marriage. We'd be like the angels. And there's four different types, four different words for love in the New Testament. And we just have one in English, so it gets a bit confusing. But two of the words are agape, which is all-consuming, the love of God to his people, which we're seeing on the cross, um, and the love that we can give to others through that love of God. And there's eros, which is sexual romantic love. And there are two different types of love. And whether you're single or married, you're caught in this greater love. And agape is the greater love. And it's not the domain of married people from this greater love, and it's not just the domain of single people from this greater love, but we're all called to it. And singleness can be a unique opportunity to go for that greater love and explore that. In Samuel 1.26, it talks about the relationship that Jonathan and David had. Jonathan was the son of Saul, who was rightful king. And he didn't hold on to that. He wanted David to be king, because that was God's call. And they had such a loving friendship that it said that the agape love, the love that existed between David and Jonathan, was greater than the love that David ever had with a woman. Meaning that... Uh, marriage isn't necessarily the ultimate institution, but there is a love greater than that that we're all called to. And Jesus himself said that greater love has no one than this, than to lay down your life for your friends. So this is what we should be aiming for. And as impossible as it sounds, um, this is the love we've all got to go to. And Jesus also said, if you love only love itself, you're of no use to God. So it means that greater love, that love of God that was shown to us, loving the unlovable. And singleness can be a unique opportunity and a unique calling, which we all have at one point or another, to give ourselves fully, to set ourselves apart fully, to explore that love and to go for that greater love. <coughs> so the overall purpose of marriage and singleness is the same, to conform us to knowing the true relationship of God more clearly. So that's really all I was going to say as a broad overview, and just to say it again, singleness is a gift, and we should open it. And I have some questions to talk about, that's quite a broad brushed overview, some questions to talk about how that could be tough, um, discuss new groups, about the individual implications. So the questions are, from your experience, what is the hardest part of singleness? Uh, why does God give the gift of singleness? Is it for everyone? And he gives it to everyone at some time or another. What is great about accepting the gift of singleness for a whole lifetime? Could this be your calling? How do you know if it's not? Have you prayed into it? And how should married couples, married couples respect the gift of people who are single? And how should we love and support people who are struggling in the whole idea of sex 
and relationships. So questions are coming up, and then we'll have time to discuss them in our next.